Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where we do a fair and objective analysis of the church and its truth claims, its history, doctrine and policy. So I have back with me Jim Bennett, who is the author of a faithful response to the CS letter. This is part three of our interview as we're going through the CS letter and so we're discussing the different topics and issues and questions that Jeremy brings up. Uh, in the previous part, we talk, we finished talking about the Book of Mormon. Um, we talked about the Book of Mormon translation. We also talked about the first vision of Joseph Smith. And then we finished talking about the Book of Abraham, I think. I don't think we covered anything else, but it was a really good discussion. And Jim was getting his sort of perspectives and his points on that. Um, how do you think the first two parts went, Jim? Uh, fine by me. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> that's, not up, that's not up to me to judge that's up to everybody else to tell me how stupid i am <laughs> i'm happy to do I well, well and i said this in the first part and there's always going to be people who have different perspectives and draw their different conclusions but i have a lot of admiration and respect for jim for his willingness to have a dialogue for him tackling the cs ladder and being one of the few people to write a response i'm going on to different podcasts and being asked the tough questions which uh nobody likes to do so grateful to have him back on i so, do i i'm a glutton for punishment but i think it's fun yeah that's the thing is that is that the tough questions are so much more fun to answer than the not so tough questions exactly i mean well, it still can be boring always... it's always the, the the simple questions that everyone knows yeah. from memory. this is the interesting yeah. stuff I yeah agree. so we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the things to do with church history uh in this part so the, we're going to talk about the priests of restoration, uh, the witnesses of the gold plates. Uh, we'll hopefully get on to temples of Freemasonry and then maybe talk about Joseph Smith's polygamy. And we'll see if we get any further, depending on how time permits. Does that okay. sound okay with you, Jim? That's just fine. Okay, so we're going to talk about the priests of restoration. Uh, and we don't need to spend super long on this part, but it, it, I think this is an important one as well. So Jeremy talks about how... Uh, so he says, like with the first vision story, that so in 1829, that's when we believe that John the Baptist and Peter, James and John, and John come and restore. Well, John the Baptist restores the Aaronic priesthood and gives Oliver and Joseph Smith the authority to baptize and to administer like ordinances, like the sacrament. And then Peter, James and John, uh, bestow, who are the previous apostles of Jesus Christ, bestow the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the authority to you know, confer the gift of the Holy Ghost and to perform priesthood blessings and other ordinances and to hold sort of high offices in the church you need to hold that priesthood. And, you know, as a missionary would have taught that that happened in 1829. But Jeremy talks about how it wasn't known in the church about the, the priest of restoration and the visitation of, uh, you know, Peter, James and John, John the Baptist until 1832. Um, and he talks about how simple... I just want to, you're conflating two things because the John the Baptist event, actually we have a contemporaneous document that indicates right. we have a date for it. We have May 15th is the date of the Aaronic priesthood restoration. Yes. Uh, we have a section of the Doctrine and Covenants that describes what John the Baptist said, and that was contemporaneous with the event. So uh, Jeremy's concern, and and I think the broader concern people have is that uh, the same is not true for the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood. We don't right, have a date. There's no date for that one. There's no date. Uh, and th there was a publication earlier that didn't mention it and that was revised later in order to mention it. And so Jeremy's point is, oh, well, this means that Joseph Smith made it up long after the fact. Yeah. And, and you talk about in your response that you see it almost like an assumption because he would, you know, draw the connection to the first vision you know, it wasn't talked about, you know, straight away. It was written down later and it was the same with, uh, you know, the, the priesthood restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood. So therefore, you know, was it a later embellishment? Um, and it, it was added to the, was it section 20 of the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants? But it wasn't yeah, that the 1833, about right. yeah, Book of Commandments. Um, right. And he sees it as either oh, later changing or embellishing the story uh, calling into question, did it actually historically happen? What, right. What's sort of like your your response, your your take on that? Uh, well, it, it's interesting to me because 
the way we found out about it is 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 sort of um, flies in the face of the idea that Joseph sort of made it up because it wasn't Joseph who first started talking about it. It was Oliver. Uh, right. You know, Oliver Cowdery was the first person to start talking about the visitation of Peter, James, and John. Uh, and so Joseph uh, puts that in the in the Book of Commandments. And as um, Richard Bushman talks about in Rough Stone Rolling, uh, this didn't cause any waves or ripples in the church. This was sort of, uh, uh, that to me demonstrates that if this was so, sort of the massive revision that Jeremy insists that it was, uh, I think you would have seen more repercussions uh, in in the practice and in the purpose of the church, you'd have a bunch of people saying, now, wait a minute, what are you talking about here? Uh, and that doesn't happen. Uh, the same thing is true, incidentally, of the first vision. When the first vision actually starts getting written down and getting circulated, there isn't anybody, uh, at least at the time, that says, now, wait a minute, this this couldn't possibly have happened. I've never heard this before. You know, the kinds of reactions you're getting from members of the church now about the rock and the hat, for instance. Why wasn't I told this? Right. You, know, yeah. you, you would think you would hear, why wasn't I told this once you start hearing about Peter, James, and John? And so that suggests to me that uh, this isn't something that took anybody by, by surprise and was probably something that was discussed uh, before it was formally sort of put in the, into the scriptural canon. Right. Now, Jeremy, he does cite uh, David Whitmer. Is it a pamphlet like yeah. to all believers in Christ um, right. who says that he never heard about an angel ordaining Joseph and Oliver uh, to the Aaronic priesthood or, you know, the Melchizedek priesthood until 1834, 1835, 1836. Um, yeah. And he doesn't believe that John the Baptist or Peter, James and John ever ordained them to the priesthood. Yeah, that's the first time you get somebody complaining, and it's it's decades after the fact. And the fact that he never heard about John the Baptist sort of flies in the face again of the second section of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, which was a revelation that was recorded contemporaneous with the event. Right. So you, know, you, you can't conflate both of those. So the fact, I think, that David Whitmer is complaining both about the Aaronic and the Melchizedek Priesthood Restoration uh weakens his case to some degree right because because those really are two very different things in terms of the records that were kept with regard to them so uh and i i don't i'd have to go back and read exactly what david whitmer says but uh, i think the extent of it is i never heard about it it wasn't it absolutely did not happen right yeah so yeah, and there's that assumption that if you would, I guess we all sort of probably expected that when the priesthood was restored in 1829, that the whole church would have known about it. The same with Joe Smith's first vision, we would have well, thought there that everybody would have known about it. Right? There was there wasn't uh, the church wasn't formed until 1830. That's so right. Yeah, the church essentially you're talking about Joseph and Oliver. Uh, Oliver is the first person baptized in this dispensation. Uh, there isn't anybody to tell. Uh, so, but we do have a document uh, that's one of the earliest documents that Joseph Smith uh, had ever recorded or written and uh, describing the prayer that was given by John the Baptist or the blessing that was given by John the Baptist at the time the priesthood was restored. So, uh, you know, it, there wasn't a church to circulate. There were six right. members of the church in April, April of 1830. And uh, later on, when we hear about the Melchizedek priesthood, you have a more sizable church, certainly. Right. But you don't have a sort of outcry that, the, that there's a revision that has happened that has changed everything. My problem that nobody ever talks about, <laughs> my problem with the Melchizedek priesthood restoration is that we are taught in the seventh section of the Doctrine and Covenants that John is a translated being, that he was blessed by the Lord to stay on the earth until the time of the second coming, ministering among the nations of the world and, and all of that. So John is, I wonder if he and the three Nephites get together for Thanksgiving dinner or something like that. I guess you don't do Thanksgiving dinner over in 
Northern Ireland, but no, we're always thankful. You're always thankful. You don't even need <laughs> it. But uh, but so so every time you see a video of the priesthood restoration, you see these sort of shining angel angelic figures that are hovering up above the ground as they lay their hands on their heads, and uh, John isn't that guy. John is is uh, you know wanders the earth. Uh, and so I'm wondering how that happened. Did Peter and James appear out of the heavens and John took a canoe down the Susquehanna? And That's a good point. I'd actually never thought of that. No, I mean, th that has always bothered me. And no one has ever talked about it. No one's ever, ever mentioned it. I, I, I don't see it as a... I, I, it, I, I, I'm, I always wonder, okay, we believe we, that there are these four, at least four men who who are ancients who are you know blessed with the ability to live until the second coming i'd like to see those guys hanging out at, at temple square once in a while <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to hear about them you know visiting with apostles and prophets we don't we don't have any record of that uh and and uh, so anyway because bringing That's, up the, the three the three Nephites and um and John the beloved who yeah you know according to scripture um and according to the doctrine and covenants revelation they've continued to tarry in the flesh that's mm -hmm. made me think about you know what because we believe in the great apostasy that the priesthood was sort of taken or lost from the earth or at least when the apostles were, were killed that God withdrew um yeah. the priesthood authority the priesthood keys were gone but then I've, I've sometimes thought about, well, what does that mean if, you know, the three Nephites... There were four people who yeah, still had the priesthood, yeah. Yeah, was there really a great apostasy? That's maybe a well, different conversation. Yeah, it, it is. I don't know. It, I mean, the Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon prophets, you know, centuries after the fact, Mormon met with the three Nephites centuries after um, Christ had been on the earth. Uh, you know... Why has that those kinds of visitations or participations stopped, or have they stopped? Uh, there's no indication that they have continued. We don't have any indication from living prophets and apostles that they spend any time with these guys. Yeah. So yeah, I, I that's yeah, they're not really talked about that much. Um, not at all. In yeah, in church settings, only only in sort of weird folklore stories where three guys show up to change your tires. Yeah, uh, yeah. You get a flat on the side of the road and then disappear, or the, or the vanishing hitchhikers, or you know, all of those kinds of things. I think they're in that film. Was it Seventeen Miracles or Ephraim oh, are they in Seventeen you, like... Miracles? Say again. They're in Seventeen. I haven't yeah. seen Seventeen Miracles. Yeah, I think they're they're in there. He, he helps a woman, and when she turns around, he's gone, and sort of implying that he was one of the three knee fights. Yeah. Um, so I think the last thing that Jeremy sort of brings up in this section, the priesthood restoration is, so it, it Peter, James, and John is talked about in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, but it's not in there in the 1833 Book of Commandments. So I guess it's two things. It's like, why weren't they included in the 1833 Book of Commandments? Was it a later sort of embellishment? Kind of going back to the first question. And then I think he also asked, how can you justify them adding or changing revelations which probably goes back to our first conversation on like yeah. nature revelation because if you have a very fundamentalist view that this is word for word being channeled from god every word is the mouth of god then how could they be later changing or altering the revelations could you give just your take on that well yeah i i mean I, I, it's hard for me actually to put my mind in the framework of the kinds of assumptions necessary to be troubled by this. Because as I read the CES letter and as I responded to it, I get the sense that Jeremy sees the gospel as sort of this fixed, uh, boxed up um, uh, set of information uh, with a beginning and an end and that at some point, and I don't know what point that would have been, uh, Joseph Smith had it all in completeness, and that was it. And we does that make any sense? That that I, was I mean, that was my me, view for twenty two years. So I I can yeah. resonate with Jeremy. That's exactly the way I viewed it. 
I'm I, probably I, don't know. I was taught it. Yeah, I don't know if this this is because of of the conversations I would have with my father or with with how I grew up, uh, but that has never ever ever been my assumption. My assumption has always been that line upon line, precept on precept, we learn more. There is more. There's always more to learn. Yeah. And uh, and it, it always baffles me that a church that is predicated on the concept of continuing revelation is also a church that continually digs in its heels and says, well, this can never, ever, 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 ever change. And it's like, well, if it can't ever change, then what's the point of continuing revelation? Mm. If, if, if additional revelation doesn't change anything, then why do we need it? You know, I, I think the idea of this kind of fixed, that it has to be, you know, boxed up. And uh, that, that's that's the idea that Joseph Smith uh, completely rejected. Uh, and it goes against the article of faith that we believe there are many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God that are yet to be revealed. So the fact that Joseph Smith revises revelations when he gets additional light and knowledge uh, or when he gets ad additional perspective. I mean, it's not that it invalidates uh, what the 1833 version is with the 1835 version. The 1835 version is just includes additional information, more light kind of and expanding. Knowledge. It's an expansion. Uh, and I think we should be grateful. We should, we should expect and embrace expansions of revelation rather than fight against them and dig our heels in and say things will never, ever, ever change. I, I see this now. You see this with people who look at the, uh, over and over again, the, the message that we hear about LGBTQ issues, and I'm sure we're going to get into that, but probably not today. Yeah. But, but continually they say, well, this could never, ever, ever, ever change. This will never change. And I just think the more you say something is never going to change, the less convincing you are. Uh, things that will are never will never ever change don't need to uh, be part of reminders that they will never ever change. We will never ever change baptism by immersion in the church. I'm I'm fairly convinced of that. Uh, you never ever hear somebody stand up and say that because everybody realizes that's the case. Yeah, the, the continued insistence that change is impossible and change will not happen comes from a place of weakness and not strength. It, it, I, I don't know who they're convincing because they're not convincing me and they're certainly not convincing themselves. Yeah. So so I, I whenever I say, OK, but this changed, this changed in church history and the revelation changed and all this changed. My reaction to that is great. Uh, that's exactly what we should expect, and that's exactly what we should hope for. And we should continually look for, for changes and for greater light and knowledge. I don't think people appreciate the fact that we, in the 21st century, know more about the restored gospel than Joseph Smith did. I I, I don't know. I mean, whatever he knew when he was talking to, to God in the sacred grove, there, there are things that we don't know that he knew, but in terms of his practice of the restored gospel, we have received additional revelation and we've received additional, you know, context for how the restoration is to be applied in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, greater light of knowledge is always something that I welcome and, mm -hmm. and not something that I'm afraid of. And you talked about in in our previous uh, episode, you talked about your your view of Revelation, which is is more of Joseph clothing, um, uh, light and understanding and sort of spiritual concepts, and he's clothing it in language, and it's not word for word, um, yes. the words coming like a fax machine from God, right. and then you know it's more loose than tight, and I think even with um, the view of probably a lot of members of the church you're very orthodox um you, you were different um maybe maybe i'm kind of unique but i would say most people would be surprised to know that the revelations have been edited or changed or some additions to them but i, I think i was trying to find it but i know i read in the introduction to the doctrine and covenants the year we read the doctrine and covenants that they talked about it somewhere in the introduction that there's been certain additions now, Jeremy doesn't talk about this, but I'm interested, interested to get your take. I was very surprised when I learned that the lectures on faith 
were oh, in yeah. the Doctrine and Covenants, and yeah. then they were removed in 1921. Because I can sort of understand, um, you know, greater light and knowledge, adding things, revising things. But I was quite surprised when I learned that oh, things were taken out. And I was like, well, is it no longer considered doctrine, no longer considered revelation? I don't think Jeremy asked that question. Have you... No. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I, I love the lectures on faith, for instance. I, I, I remember when I first read them, I thought every, every member of the church ought to be reading this. And I think the reason we don't is because they imply that the Holy Ghost is not a personage of spirit. The mind and of God. That, that, that the Holy Ghost is kind of, the, the way the Jehovah's Witnesses describe the Holy Ghost is that it's God's active force. And the lectures on faith, I don't know what the exact language is, but that's kind of how I think of it. That's how they yeah. describe the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I know it talks about there's two personages in the Godhead. I think it's pretty evident that Joseph does, at least either he doesn't know or he doesn't say that God has a body because the Father's referred to as a personage of spirit. Whereas if you right. contrast that with, was it section 130? It talks about the Father yeah. having a body of flesh and bones. So we, even if he did believe there were separate beings, there is he definitely a evolutionist understanding of the nature right. of God and the Godhead. Right. And so I and I think that was problematic. And, and now that the church is essentially a section 130, Joseph definitively says God is a physical being. Christ is a physical being. The Holy Ghost is a being, but is a being personage of spirit. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I think it took until... I mean, section 130 is not um, a revelation in the same way that, say, section 76 is a revelation. Section 76 and the three degrees of glory was sort of this, this magnificent piece of intelligence that was just dumped on Joseph and Sidney Rigdon all in one sitting and written all in one sitting. Uh, but section 130 is a number of things that Joseph taught near the end of his life and they're cobbled together into a into a section but it it, it wasn't received in that way right it's it's it, it, it's just things that the church has said okay well we believe that joseph taught this and we believe that this is um canonizable and and authoritative and so we're going to put it in scripture um so, yeah, I think Joseph's understanding of that evolves. And that that troubles a lot of people because, wait a minute, he was in the first vision. And I'm thinking, well, sure he was. Uh, I don't know that he ever, you know, uh, felt physically the bodies of the father or the son to know if they were flesh and blood or if they were just spiritual manifestation, manifestations or what they were. Yeah. Uh, the fact that he didn't know or understand that until later in his life uh, makes makes perfect sense to me. I don't see have any problem with that. And the fact that he didn't understand what the Holy Ghost is, um, to some degree, we still don't understand what the Holy Ghost is. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, there, there's a lot of talk about whether or not the Holy Ghost is Heavenly Mother. I know oh. Fiona Gibbons got in trouble with the Maxwell Institute because she suggested that the Holy Ghost is Heavenly Mother and that all three members of the Godhead are present and the father and the son and, and the mother are both there at the first vision. My understanding uh, is I thought that the Holy Ghost was a, a male spirit. Um, that, that was my yeah. understanding, but we don't talk too well, much about the Holy Ghost. We don't talk really. about it. We don't, I mean, we, it, it's not discussed in any kind of way that, that we really understand. I mean, how, how does the Holy Ghost speak to you and speak to me? Uh, at the same time, if he's a sort of, if he's a person, personage of spirit, and uh, in primary, he well, his his spirit radiates. Uh, how does that work? I mean, we don't know. We don't have any idea. I mean, we we have ideas, but we don't. I mean, we can't quantify it. We can't we can't pin it down. And the lectures on faith, I think, demonstrate an earlier understanding of these things that has fallen out of favor and and therefore was taken out of the Doctrine and Covenants. Interestingly right. enough, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, that title um, actually makes direct reference to the Lectures on Faith. The Lectures on Faith were the Doctrine, the Revelations were the Covenants. That's right. And then they took, they took the Lectures on Faith out. Uh, the Lectures on Faith were never presented 
as uh, sort of revelatory documents. They were um, sort of a, almost an academic theological treatise in terms of this is this is how this is the theology essentially yeah. of the church. Um, we don't do theology very much in the church anymore. Uh, the lectures on faith was probably the last gasp of that effort. I mean, if you go and talk to Catholic scholars and they, they have all kinds of theological treatises and theological studies, uh, we don't have anything of that, at least nothing formalized. We have, you know, I mean, you can read all kinds of scholars who have posited their own ideas of, of Mormon theology and you can read my versions of Mormon theology and in my CES letter reply, but in terms of the authoritative, definitive theology of the church, uh, we've never really done that. Right. And I think the lectures on faith were sort of an attempt to do that. And when the decision was made that it doesn't really reflect the full light and understanding that we've received in the interim, we decided to we decided to take it out of the DNC. But anybody can still read it. It's still out yeah. there. And uh, and I recommend people do read it because there's a lot of stuff in there that's really wonderful. I think the church does have an article on their website, probably in the LDS. There's like a church history topic section where I think they do talk about the lectures on faith and yeah. you know, sort of what's roughly sort of contained in it and the history and when and why it was taken out as well. So yeah. we just finished off the priest or restoration section. If, unless do you have anything else to add? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, so this is actually a question that um, kind of kind of new to me in his CS letter. It's one that I've not really thought about a whole lot. But he says, why did contemporary say the high priesthood was given for the first time in June 1831? I think it's some conference. Joseph Smith himself was ordained to this high priesthood by Lyman White. If Joseph was already an elder and apostle, what was the necessity of being ordained again? Um, right. Um and when he, when, he, when he framed that, I, I had never heard that until I read it in the CES letter. So I went and dug it up. And sort of the shallow apologetic argument is um, that they were uh, being ordained to offices in the Melchizedek priesthood for the first time. Right. What's, what's the year? Was it 1830? Uh, 1831. 31. Um but Richard Bushman takes issue with that. Uh, and so I, because I, he, he says, that's not what the documents say. They don't say that uh, they're being ordained to offices. It says they are being ordained to the high priesthood. Yeah. Um, but it, so, but if you dig into it and, and you see what was actually happening and, and Jeremy says, well, Joseph Smith was ordained to the high priesthood by Lyman White. What Jeremy doesn't tell you is that prior to that, Lyman White was ordained to the high priesthood by Joseph Smith. Uh, so, I mean, some, something's going on here that uh, the idea that that's the first time Joseph Smith received the priesthood, it's really kind of circular to assume that he received the priesthood from a guy who he gave the priesthood to just prior to the receipt of it. So, so I, I, I don't fully understand or, or re recognize what's going on here. I, I'm trying to remember what I actually wrote about it. Yeah, I, I think... I end up, I wanted to stop because when I researched this, I wanted to stop with the sort of shallow apologetics and say, yeah. oh, they were just ordaining each other high priests and elders. They weren't ordaining, you know, but Bushman wouldn't let me do that. Uh, yeah, and this is one I'm not super familiar with myself. I know Dan Vogel and, and some of his videos that I, I watched years ago, he believes that there is a development in priesthood yeah. and he only sees the Melchizedek priesthood and the high priesthood almost like a there was like an av an evolution, uh, so to speak. I know in your in your response, the notes I took down, similar to what you were saying, is that he received um, the Melchizedek priest in 1829, but the, the ordination to the office of high priest is maybe came maybe later. Well, well, I I think part of this too is um, one of the things that we don't talk about much is how many times people in the church. In, in the in the beginning of the church were baptized they were baptized multiple times uh, they're baptized for the remission of sins then they're rebaptized in order to become members of the church 
when they got to the Salt Lake Valley, they were all rebaptized again just to sort of recommit themselves. Uh, hmm. This is not something we do now. Yeah. Uh, but it's something they felt was appropriate to do then. And uh, I'm wondering and speculating if this might have some kind of similar similar feel to it. This idea of ordaining people to the high priesthood, uh, you know, well, now we have a new responsibility. Now we more fully understand it. So let's just do this again so we can get it right. Uh, I, I mean, that's me speculating. I don't have any hard evidence on that. And I don't really have enough information about this to to comment on it definitively, uh, only to say that if you're going to argue that Joseph Smith didn't get the priesthood before getting it from Lyman White, that's a pretty flimsy, silly argument if you recognize that Lyman White got the priesthood from Joseph Smith. Why did Joseph Smith, right. if he didn't have the priesthood, feel like he had the authority to give that priesthood to Lyman White and then have Lyman White return? I mean, I don't understand it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I think it's consistent with the kinds of evolution they see in rituals and practices in the early church. Okay. That's grand. Um, we'll move on and we'll talk about the, the witnesses of the gold plate. So we, in the, yeah. you know, at the beginning of uh, every book of Mormon coffee, you have the, the testimony of Joseph Smith and then the testimony of the three witnesses who claim to see, uh, you know, a vision of the angel Moroni and to see the gold plates and then eight witnesses who testified to seeing and holding and hefting the gold plates. Hefting, plate. yes, I love in, that word. Yeah. I hefted the plates. Yeah, in a more natural way, not in a uh, supernatural way as much, although some critics might push back a little bit on that. Um, but you talk about that the testimony of the three and the eight witnesses, it certainly adds credibility to the gold plates being real. It adds credibility to its evidence to support the Book of Mormon uh, on top of, you know, spiritual claims and Joseph Smith being uh, a prophet. And I took this little bit from your response to uh, the witnesses. You talk about how many of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon plates, including all the three witnesses, uh, became deeply disaffected with the prophet, yet all remained true to their testimonies, even though they had significant incentive to expose Joseph's fraud. Their testimonies have been under attack for nearly two centuries, and yet they still hold up. There are over 60 first-hand accounts by these witnesses that, that describe the physical reality of the gold plates, and they do so without the kind of spiritual eye nonsense that is included in all of your second-hand hearsay accounts, many of which were written decades after the fact by people who did not know any of the witnesses personally. So yeah, you, you would see that there's a lot of consistent first-hand accounts which um, add credibility. Certainly they don't prove um, they're still faith required, right. but they add cred credibility. Anything you want to add to sort of like your well, statement on the, the you witnesses? Know, you know, I conceded when we talked about the Book of Abraham, that the Book of Abraham is the strongest argument against the church. Yeah. Uh, uh, the argument against the witnesses is so much flimsier than uh, the critics want you to believe. And Jeremy's section on the witnesses in the CES letter is arguably next to maybe his Book of Mormon name section, which he even admits is lousy. But this the way he, he uses the witness testimony in the secondhand sources is really embarrassing. Uh, he, he, he has essentially two sources uh, I can't even remember their names. I have to go back and look again. I think Stephen Burnett is one. He's, he's one, and there's another one. Uh, but he quotes from their documents different sections as if it's a different person talking each time, as if there are all these people that are saying this, when in fact it's two people. These are two people that didn't know the witnesses and 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 are making these assumptions based on second, third-hand accounts decades after the fact, coming from wildly antagonistic sources. Uh, when you have over 60 firsthand accounts from these people describing the physical nature of the plates, uh, you know, two people who didn't know these guys reporting on rumors decades after the fact, 
I mean, there's no comparison. There's no historian that would give that more weight or even anywhere near as much weight as the weight of the firsthand contemporaneous accounts. And over and over and over again, uh, these men found themselves in circumstances where um, denying their testimony would have been entirely to their advantage. Oliver Cowdery, after he had left the church, was trying to make a career as a lawyer. And in a law case, uh, the, the uh, opposing counsel pointed out, you can't listen to this guy because he believes that uh, in angels and gold plates. And in the middle of the trial, Oliver Cowdery reaffirms his testimony of the Book of Mormon, despite the fact that it would hurt his client and it would hurt his case. But it's important enough to him that that he still was willing to affirm it. David Whitmer, yeah. who never reconciled with the church and was bitterly, bitterly, uh, uh, you know, disaffected from the prophet Joseph Smith, uh, at the end of his life, makes sure that everybody recognizes that he has never denied his testimony of the Book of Mormon, and he reaffirms the physical nature of the plates. I, you know, it, it's it, it's significant enough that you have to ask yourself, uh, okay, why, even after Joseph was dead, did David Whitmer feel like he had to had to be true to this testimony? Because, I, I mean, I've heard all kinds of theories of like, well, well, Joseph was alive, he could blackmail them, or he could do this, I mean, that he had some kind of hold over them. Uh, by the time David Whitmer is giving his final testimony of the Book of Mormon, uh, the Mormons are in Utah and got nothing to do with David Whitmer, and there's nothing they can do to David Whitmer. And yet here he is reaffirming his testimony. Why? Uh, you know, the, the fact that they all left the church, everybody sort of harps on that. But to me, that's a that gives them greater credibility. These are guys outside the church that Joseph Smith is vilifying. I mean, Joseph yeah. Smith says terrible things about all three of these guys at certain points in their lives. And so, yeah, the guy's a fraud. They know he's a fraud. Uh, there's a lot to be gained and and nothing really to be lost by exposing the fraud and being the champion that brings down the charlatan Joseph Smith. None of those guys take that opportunity. And as, and as far as I can tell, none of the eight witnesses take that opportunity. It's interesting because even uh, uh, you know non-believing or even critical historians uh, try to account for the existence of some kind of physical artifact. Yes, Even it's kind of undeniable. I mean, there, there are it's... enough accounts by enough people, not just the three and the eight witnesses. You know, Emma talks about uh, feeling, you know, leaping through them under a cloth. Yeah. I, I always wonder, like, why didn't you pick up the cloth? What, did you think you are going to get struck by an angel? Maybe you would have been. I don't know. I don't understand that. I would have picked up the claw. You would have been. You would have been curious. Your curiosity would have took over. But, uh, but it's not just Emma. You have all kinds of people that have have these different experiences with some kind of physical artifact, and so you have historians that try to come up with the idea that Joseph manufactured plates out of tin. Uh, I'll be Dan Vogel's some kind theory. Of, yeah, uh, Dan Vogel says critics. tin plates. And other critics. So so so. Uh, I don't think the witnesses are anywhere near as easily dismissed as Jeremy does. And I really think the critical arguments against them uh, really don't hold water. I don't know if it's Dan Vogel that talks about hypnotism of the three witnesses. The yeah. Witnesses. So, um, yeah, I did a recent interview with Dan Vogel. So I'm going to try to represent him. Well, I don't remember everything we discussed. Um so Dan Vogel's position, so he would agree that the witnesses were sincere. I think most critics would that they they're honest men in their community. They they weren't lying, they weren't part of a conspiracy. You know, I think that would be hard to believe that they were just all making it up, even though they all left the church all lying about it. Um, they never discounted their testimonies, you know, and even to the end of their lives, the three witnesses all continued to bear their testimonies. Now, Dan Vogel would, he would, he would view the Stephen Burnett letter as more credible because he said there was two people, I can't remember who the second one was, but it was Stephen Burnett and another who were both there when Martin Harris gave that statement, you know, about none of the witnesses actually seeing the plates with their literal, you know, physical eyes, but it was spiritual eyes and 
the eight witnesses saw them through a cloth and um, he, he would see that as more credible, that statement, even though it's secondhand because it was written after the fact and there's two statements that corroborate each other. So in his view, he thinks there's, there's something to that. He also talked about a statement by John Whitmer, who's one of the eight witnesses, who talked about seeing the plates by a supernatural power, um, indicating, well, was it some sort of a vision he needed to have in order to see the plates where they covered in a cloth? Um, and then when it, when it comes to the three witnesses, his sort of view was that there's no way we can know with any certainty if it was a real vision or could it have been a hallucination? Um, and he talked about not so much that Joe Smith hypnotized them, but there is the power of suggestion. So it was um, sort of like prophesied that they would see the plates if they had enough faith and they were all sort of praying in a, like a religious sort of frame of mind and, and fervor before the experience. And he, in our conversation, um, if I'm trying to represent him fairly, he said he can't say with certainty it was a hallucination, but he said we can't discount the possibility or probability it could have been and he would lean that way because he doesn't believe the book mormon is historical which is another conversation i think i'm trying to represent him fairly and any thoughts on that and jeremy also brings up that they they had this magical worldview or visionary mindset so it was maybe more yeah, Jer jeremy's description of his of the magical worldview is i mean he talks about they, they would refer to spiritual eyes all the time it's like no they wouldn't I mean, I mean, Jeremy. Jeremy puts together. He cobbles together this sort of uh, framework of what a 19th century person believed. That all 19th century people had spiritual eyes and not physical eyes as well, and this, that, and the other. And it it, it just doesn't really come from anywhere other than uh, a sort of Actually, makeshift attempt to account for. Well, sorry, I was just going to say it's worked eyes. over Michael Quinn to some degree. I was just going to spiritualize Go it's scriptural. Go um, you know, in the book of Moses, when Moses sees God, he talks about that he saw God oh, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. His, with his spiritual eyes. Uh, his natural eyes would have withered away, uh, but he, he saw right, it sort right. of in the spirit. And in my sort of discussion with Dan, I said, to him, well, does spiritualize, does that mean it was imaginary or a vision? Like, like, does that mean it's not real if it was with spiritual eyes? Because I, I know there's a statement from David Whitmer. He talks about, like, of course, we were in the spirit when we saw the angel. Right. But, you know, no man can see an angel without being in the spirit. But it, we were in the body also. So it was like a natural, supernatural experience. Right. Well, I, what, what I'm doing is I, I'm, I'm, I'm complaining about how Jeremy uses spiritual eyes. Because he yes, didn't there... literally see them. Well, well Jer Jeremy's discussion of spiritual eyes is that this is a all 19th century people thought in these terms. And I don't think that's the case. I do think you're right and accurate that Joseph taught particularly that you had to have some kind of spiritual strengthening or something to allow you to experience God, to see God. Yeah, like transfiguration. Um, transfiguration I mean, what that is, how that works, uh, I mean who knows that's that's really cut that's impossible to quantify yeah uh but but um you know uh, all of that when we don't know for instance if the first vision um was you know physical spiritual how that worked i mean i mean you, you can you can dive into that as much as you want i i and and that's a, that's a, a concept that goes back to the new testament paul talks about being um you know um lifted up into the third heaven whether in the body or out i cannot tell uh he, he i mean he doesn't know he's not able to delineate that uh so i i mean i think you see a lot of those kinds of things yeah uh but all of that is mitigated by the fact that you also have statements by these men that you know it was as real as anything else they've ever seen uh, the idea, the idea that some kind of mass hallucination, which I don't really understand how that would work, considering the fact that these are three different people, how do they hall hallucinate the same thing in every respect? Martin Harris had the vision separate from the other two witnesses. That's right. He describes a vision that is identical 
to that of the other two witnesses. So how you come together and have some kind of group hallucination that is consistent over decades of time and is compelling enough that you're able to risk and sacrifice your reputation and your fortune and everything else in defense of this hallucination, uh, that doesn't make a lick of sense to me. Uh, maybe it makes sense to somebody else, and it certainly makes more sense to somebody who refuses to allow for the possibility of a supernatural visit, vision or visitation. But but I, I don't think Dan Vogel's explanation is really much of an explanation at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't think the... Um, the, the the eagerness to sort of dismiss this as, oh, well, this was just all a sp spiritual nonsense. Um, I, I, I don't think the historical record backs that up. I think there are too many accounts of people encountering some kind of physical object and the eight witnesses being, they, they, the eight witnesses, at least in their statement, I don't know if John Whitmer later on said something. I haven't, I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, it may very well be the case, but their statement is a very physical statement. It's, yeah, we we lifted them, we hefted them, and we know that he's got the plates. They don't bear testimony of anything. I mean, the, the statement of the, of the three witnesses is this big, huge, elaborate theophany, and they bear testimony of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, which is one God, amen. We don't get into the Trinitarian nature of the three witnesses statement, but it, hmm. it's there um so so i i what just don't say um because me and dan talked about this as well and he pointed out to me that um yeah like mass hallucination theory does seem less likely you know obviously if it was one person like joe smith's first vision you could say it could have been a real vision or maybe it was a hallucination because we or maybe you know, it's a lie or a lie, right? yeah. I mean, if it's uh -huh. just one person and there are no other witnesses, yeah, he could have made it up. I mean, mm -hmm. but but three people making up the same thing uh, when two of them had it. I mean, it it just doesn't. It it's a whole lot harder for me to swallow. Mm, to yeah, just, it definitely uh, adds credibility. Um, and, and I said to him because the Book of Mormon even prophesies that three witnesses would see the plates. So that was pretty impressive and kind of risky you know for joseph to prophesy that and that would be pretty hard to replicate if it's you know if it wasn't a a real vision um but i think jeremy talks about this as well and so did dan in our interview point out that the witnesses are are not completely unique and that there's been maybe other instances of people having a mass hallucination i think it was, was it the shakers with the virgin claiming to see the virgin mary um, you know, I remember I, w I went through a time where I, I've watched a lot of like near death experiences or people claiming visions of things. Uh, I remember there's two, I think, were the Catholic sisters who both claim to see the Virgin Mary. So right. while it's less likely to have a mass hallucination, what would you say to them saying, well, there's been other times throughout human history of people claiming a mass vision or hallucination, like more than one person uh, Jeremy does this a number of times in the CES letter in that he points out, well, other people have the, other people have been frauds. So that's evidence that Joseph Smith is a fraud. And I think this is sort of a similar argument. And I think he even makes this argument. I mean, I think that women who see the Virgin Mary or uh, or whatever else, each of those needs to be evaluated on its own merits. Right. I don't think it, it adds or takes away from the consistency and the power of the witness's testimony. The fact that there are people who will believe things that are not true and have borne testimony of things that are not true does not, it does, it does not logically follow that that invalidates the testimony of the three or the eight witnesses. Mm. There are also people who have borne testimony of things that are true. Uh, so you have to take each case according to its own merits. You have to right, deal okay. with it. And so, so I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know nearly enough about the Shakers or about the, I, I am of the opinion, and maybe this makes me somewhat heretical, but I am of the opinion that uh, there are miraculous manifestations that happen outside the boundaries of the church. 
uh, throughout history. Uh, I, I mean, there, there are some first presidency statements that back that up that talk about Muhammad and Buddha and other great religious leaders receiving a certain measure of light from the Lord. Yes, uh, yeah. I, I very much believe that. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I can't quantify it. Uh, I don't think um, my faith is contingent upon me invalidating the validity of those experiences. And I don't think the invalidity of those experiences, whether or not they're they're true or not, really has any weight or bearing on whether or not the witnesses are telling the truth. Right. No, no, I I sort of resonate and agree with a lot of what you're saying. I, I know a critic would probably push back and say, um, you know, it would be arrogant or biased of us to say, oh, well, these these visions, these experiences, they're, they're real, they're valid. Uh, but those sisters who claim to see the Virgin Mary, you know, that, that's that's not valid. I don't think you're quite saying that. You're, you're not, saying, uh, not only am I not quite saying that, I'm saying precisely the opposite. I think it's entirely yeah. possible. Yeah, it's possible. Sisters saw the Virgin Mary. I, I, I haven't investigated the claim. I don't understand anything about it beyond mm -hmm. what you just said. Mm -hmm. But but I, I I would not in a million years. Well, I, I guess I would in a million years if I investigated it and came to a different conclusion. But but without that information, I, I, I'm not going to tell God what he can and can't do, who he can and can't talk to. Right. And whether the Virgin Mary can or can't appear to somebody. Uh, that's entirely a separate issue that right. should be dealt with on its own. And I and and somebody that believes that and and draws strength from that, I say more power to them. And yeah, it's uh, similar and, to like uh, people who have claimed visions of seeing God or Jesus, uh, because loads of people have. Um loads that of people necessarily have, have to invalidate or mean Joseph Smith's is any less. Well, true. loads of people also have within the church. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people that describe having theophanies within the church. Yeah. Uh uh how many of those are valid? How many are not? I don't know. Are some of them valid? I think so. Yeah. I think similar to, you know, I talked about this with Dan, similar to those who claimed um, to see Jesus' resurrection, the disciples, um, like right. the Book More Witnesses, it still kind of comes down to faith, even though I think um, it adds credibility. It still requires faith to believe their testimonies. It's not proof. It's not going to convince people no and i think i don't like when certain christians say the um the testimony of the three and the eight witnesses isn't valid but then the testimony of the disciples of christ is I, again i think right. you need to be consistent um you know you need to apply the same scrutiny to both okay well i think that's been a good discussion on the witnesses any last thoughts before we jump to the next topic uh no i think we're good we're we're, we're moving along here yeah we're good i think we're it's PAC, but we're having good discussion. Uh, so let's talk about temples and Freemasonry. And I'm going to be careful not to say anything that might seem uh, disrespectful. I'm maybe just going to stick to some of his questions. Some of them I might tone uh, down a little bit. I, I, before you, you do that, I agree with you. I'm going to try not to be disrespectful. At the same time, uh, it is amazing to me how reticent people are to talk about things that we have not made covenants not to talk about. Yes. Make any sense? I mean, exactly. there, there are things yeah. in the temple that we have specifically covenanted not to discuss, and yes. I'm not going to discuss those, and I don't think you're going to bring them up. No. Uh, but the vast majority of what happens in the temple um, is not something that we've made a covenant not to discuss. And to the church's credit, in the last few years, they've been far more open about what happens in the temple, what people wear in the temple. You can yeah. go on the church's website and see pictures of temple clothing. You can't right. see uh, models of people wearing temple clothing. That, that's a bridge too far. Uh, but you can see the temple clothing. You can see videos that describe in, in some detail the endowment, that, that they talk about it being a ritual that, that goes through the creation, Adam and Eve, and likens us to Adam and Eve, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, uh, and uh, garments, you can see pictures of garments. Uh, you can see frank discussions of garments, what they are, what they symbolize, um, and, and an admission that they are not magic underwear. That, <laughs> that if somebody shoots a bullet at you and you're wearing your garments, like you're likely going to have to go to the emergency room. And yeah, there's uh, all those folklore, 
folk folklore stories isn't there of people oh. like in a fire and like their trousers burn but it doesn't damage their garments and like they they provide special yeah. physical so, so i hate those stories because but it's like so so the Lord doesn't care about your what about your head your head isn't covered by the garment the Lord doesn't <laughs> care about your head you know uh, it was the guy it was the marriott what well, uh, the head of the Marriott company on 60 Minutes talked about being in a boating accident. He was burned on his arm all the way up to the garment sleeve. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I thought, how is that a faith promoting story? Why does God not care about your arm? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me at all. So anyway, so, so that said, uh, don't be so reticent not to talk about the temple because you think that I'm not, I'm going to be uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, I think you know you know specifically what those things are. We've covenanted not to reveal, and we won't yeah. reveal those. Uh, everything else, as far as I'm concerned, is fair game. Yeah. So, so for me, um, whenever I first learned about the similarities between Freemasonry and the Temple Endowments, uh, I think it's similar for a lot of people. It floored me. Um, and, and you talk about this that you know Revelation doesn't come in a vacuum, and that would have been my my understanding. But Jeremy talks about you know seven weeks. After Joseph, um, his Masonic initiation, when he, you know, joined Freemasonry and didn't he advance to, was it Master Mason? Uh, and then seven weeks later, he introduced the LDS Temple Endowment and that there are uh, similar sort of the rituals and the things that we do in there. A lot of the actions are directly borrowed or plagiarized, some critics would say, uh, from Freemasonry and that he's pretty much ripped off from masonry and then put his own spin on it um yep what are your thoughts on that we'll do a few more follow-up questions as well um it, it troubled me too when i really kind of discovered it uh and i sort of went through mental contortions to try to say to try to put joseph in a vacuum right to, to say well if if the temple ceremony uh is derivative of the masonic temple ceremony um then that's proof that it isn't revelation and so i went through all kinds of gyrations to try to make that happen and eventually failed and and realized there's no question that the masonic temple ceremony that joseph smith experienced seven weeks before introducing the endowment uh was fundamental to joseph to how joseph smith um presented the endowment and created yeah, some things are they're, they're identical near enough they're, well, they're identical and it's interesting what's interesting is is i'm older than you i first went through that's not what's interesting uh, but uh <laughs> i i went never thought temple. yeah I'm like a day I over 30. uh <laughs> oh i don't yes i do i look like i look at least three days over 30. um i first went through the temple in 1987 is that right yeah, June of 1987. Uh, it was prior to the 1990 revisions. Right. Uh, penalties were removed in the interim. I went through the temple when there, there were still penalties. Um, and my uncle, who was a state president at the time, said that removing the penalties also removed some like two thirds of people's complaints about the temple after going through the first time. Because yeah. the penalties were so were so um, disturbing and so Masonic. Penalties were, initially the penalties were word for word Masonic. It was, if I reveal this stuff, you know, that my my tongue will be ripped from my throat and, and my innards will be scattered among the beasts of the field and all kinds of nonsense like that. Um, and they were toned down before I went through, but there were still penalties yeah. that my life would be taken. Uh, uh, or, or, or really that rather than reveal them, uh, uh, I would prefer my life to be taken, something like that. Anyway, but they're taken out. And, and I think one of the reasons they're taken out is, is they are. They're entirely Masonic in or, origin, that there isn't really any kind of revelatory or, um, or spiritual value to them. Uh, right. They were sort of a Masonic leftover. And other sort of Masonic leftovers uh were taken out there was a thing called the five points of fellowship that happened at the veil that no longer happens at the veil yeah uh, but i think it still happens if you're Mason, if you're a mason you know uh i mean th th there are several things like that 
Um, I read a an article uh, by a guy who was both a Mason and a Mormon uh, that really helped me understand this in a way that makes some sense to me. And, and what he describes is, he says, the Masonic elements of the of the endowment are not the endowment. The covenants are the endowment. And the, the endowment, uh, I mean, the ceremony is the delivery mechanism. And here you have Joseph Smith going through a Masonic temple experience and seeing uh, illiterate, um, uneducated farmers and, and rural people who have never spent a day in school in their life or haven't spent adults who are, are uneducated and illiterate uh, reciting back huge portions of information as part of the ceremony that he saw this as the teach. This is a great way to teach things. And this is a way that these guys will respond. And so he took that vehicle and attached the covenants and the things that matter in the endowment ceremony to that vehicle because he thought it was a it was a good teaching mechanism an exercise uh, or 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 the lord uh, allowed him to do that because i think I, if you read the early um the early saints talking about the endowment and about masonry they talk about how the endowment our endowment is the i don't think masons refer to their ceremony as an endowment um, i don't think so I don't think, but, but uh, the, the Masonic ceremonies, they say, we have the true Masonry. I think Joseph believed that Masonry, I mean, Masonry claims to have been passed down from the Temple of Solomon, yeah, uh, which is nonsense. The Masonry began in what, the 16th century? Or maybe a little earlier than that, maybe the 13th century. But it's, it's relatively, it, it, it's nowhere near the Temple of Solomon's time. Yeah, don't they come from uh, but, stone masons uh, during medieval times? Yeah, yeah, Masonic guilds, you know, stone masons. I mean, creating sort of a guild. Uh, um, yeah, so a, a union, I guess, is is a more modern version of it. Uh, but uh, these ceremonies sort of were a fraternal bond between people within a Mason stone mason guild, and uh, they were they in order to give them weight, they said, oh, well, this is from the Temple of Solomon, when really there's absolutely no indication that it is. Uh, so Joseph Smith goes through this, and and the, the, the entirely faithful version of this would be, he senses something ancient about it. Uh, he senses that there is some kind of value in these rituals, and then receives a revelation that gives us the true version of how they're supposed to be practiced. I think if you were to ask, you know, Parley Pratt and and Brigham Young and, and, and anybody who went through the endowment when Joseph Smith was alive, that's probably the explanation they would give you. I don't think they yeah. would give you the explanation, oh, this had nothing to do with that. I mean, this came totally out of the blue and had absolutely nothing to do with the almost identical thing that happened seven weeks ago. Uh, I mean, they recognized, and that wasn't a problem for them. I mean, they recognized, okay, yeah, he's using something. He's pulling something from it. And, he's restoring. Uh, he's restoring yeah. something. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't fully buy into that because I don't think that masonry bears any resemblance to the Temple of Solomon at all. I think you have kind of a Book of Abraham sort of thing going on here in that Joseph yeah. believed it did. Uh, but I don't think it did. And and, and I don't think, I, I, I think what matters in the temple are the covenants that we make uh, and, the, you know, the, the understanding, the broad understanding of the purpose of mortality. Uh, it took me years and years to realize that Adam and Eve has far more value as a metaphor for my life than it does as a historical event. Uh, that each of us is Adam and Eve. Each of us chooses to partake of the knowledge of good and evil and leave the presence of God and enter into a sinful world. Uh, the endowment is what taught me that in a way that I didn't fully understand just by reading the scriptures. Right. So I, I, I think, 
again, you have Joseph who maybe didn't fully understand what he was doing, uh, being used by the Lord to introduce a teaching mechanism that allows for us to make the kinds of covenants and uh, and things that we need to do uh, in mortality. Uh, also, uh, I, I the most beauty I found in the temple uh, is actually not in the temple itself. It's in the idea of seeking out our ancestors and binding the entire human family together. Uh, I think that's the temple salience in my life, uh, more so than the actual endowment ceremony, uh, which I confess, I it's long. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I were president of the church, here's my plan. When I'm president of the church, you heard it here first. Okay. Uh, you would have a two-track, you'd have a two-track temple ceremony. You'd have the current track, which is exactly the way it is now. And then for those who have already made those covenants and have already gone through that, you can go through a second track where you go in and you make your covenants and you have a prayer circle and you go through the veil. Whole thing would take five to 10 minutes tops. <laughs> That's it. It is long. And then you'd spend and then you'd spend all the time in the celestial room uh, or or maybe other places designated in the temple as sort of meditative places. Because all these people that tell me, I went through the temple, whenever I have a problem, I go through the temple so I can consider the problem. And I'm like, well, when are you considering it? When you're taking your clothes on and off? When you're standing up and sitting down? And when you, I mean, it's like, there's too much going on. Uh, the only time when I have to just sort of sit and consider my problems and be contemplative is in the celestial room. By the time I've gotten to the celestial room, I'm thinking I've already been here over two hours. I need to get home. I need to do the dishes. You know, I, I, so, uh, uh, for me, the thing that is the most beautiful about the temple and most powerful about the temple is the way it turns the hearts of the children to the fathers in the way that Malachi describes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that's the value of it. Uh, I don't think there is any doubt, at least in my mind, that uh, the Masonic ceremony had a direct influence on Joseph Smith in creating the endowment ceremony. Uh, I also don't have a problem with that. Mm. I did have a problem with that. I don't anymore. Yeah. And, and and I certainly have empathy for those who, who do have a problem with that. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I, I know the church would differentiate between the endowment or like the, the revelation, the covenants between the presentation of the endowment and sort of like the rituals and things we do. Um, I don't know. Have you watched any, any videos? Um, this is sort of, going away from the CS ladder for a wee minute, um, like from fair Mormon conferences, I remember I listened to a scholar talk about like ancient temple rites that were practiced both by, you know, ancient priests, but all, also like early uh, Christians and like Gnostic groups that had actually some parallels between our temple endowments. And yeah. I actually find those quite interesting. There, there, are, there are elements of the temple endowment that are the prayer circle particularly. Yeah. Uh, is is very ancient yeah and, and can be found and, and i don't think it can be found in the masonic temple ceremonies yeah no um uh, so th no there are elements that this is the thing there are elements of antiquity in the temple uh there are certainly uh, i think there's certainly a great deal of revelatory content in the temple i think the delivery mechanism uh it comes largely from the masonic ceremonies yeah so yeah to you and probably to me as well i'd have to go back and i'm, I'm definitely going to cover temples and freemasonry more in depth on, on my channel and relook into some of those studies but it seems like it's more complex than he just ripped it off masonry but there's it no is. question masonry was an influence or a, you could even say a catalyst for the yeah. endowment well it's an influence it's a catalyst but it's also I mean, to say he ripped it off, uh, I mean, it is. I, Just makes him think like he's plagiarizing. Well, see, uh, I, I don't know. This is a whole other wild and dangerous discussion. Yeah. Uh, people, do you know who Harold Bloom is? I've Harold, heard of him. Uh, Harold Bloom just adores Joseph Smith, doesn't believe 
He's not a believer in any way, shape, or form. But he thinks one of the most amazing things about Joseph Smith is that he was able to sort of take all of these elements of all of these disparate traditions and disparate practices and and sort of meld them into a cohesive whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And, and I think that's exactly what Joseph did. Uh, Joseph did all, I mean, you can find pieces of the gospel, of the restored gospel in all kinds of different traditions. Yeah. And I think Joseph as a prophet and as a seer was able to sort of lift the bits that really are truly inspired and bring them together in a cohesive whole that holds together very well and is really remarkable and I think is a product of, of revelation and the inspiration of God. Okay. Uh, so going back to, you know, you, you brought up some of the changes in the temple. I, I went through the endowment whenever I was back in 2015. And even then I've seen changes to how they do the, the washings and anointings. Right. Uh, even that was removed. in 2005, I think they changed that. But even I went through, whenever I went through, they did further changes. So th there's been an evolution in how certain yeah. parts are administered. They've taken out what you could argue are maybe sexist elements from whenever I first yeah. went through the temple to to now. You talk about yeah. the points of fellowship and the blood oaths. Somebody would yeah. say, how can they justify if this was a an ordinance that was restored by the prophet Joseph Smith? How could they? justify changing and removing parts does that mean they were never um part of the you know the restored temple endowment in the first place they weren't inspired and are they are they changing things for example removing the death penalties because people were pretty you know disturbed by it or removing maybe the elements that seem a little bit sexist you know towards yeah. women are they removing that because of sort of people's reaction like are, are they altering revelation or an ordinance which you know shouldn't be altered what, what would be your take on that i don't understand why it can't be both i don't understand why it can't be uh people's reactions which were negative um uh, spurred leaders to seek greater light and knowledge and therefore spurred changes right right um I think it's it's imperative that we understand that that's how things work. I get very frustrated with the 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 current church when we try to deny that that ever happens. Uh, do you remember the 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 big out uproar about the Manti Temple murals Did that make its way out to Northern Ireland? Uh, uh, remind me. Well, so so Minerva Tykert uh, is one of the great Latter Day Saint artists in history. Uh, painted a bunch of spectacular murals that are that uh, are all over the Manti Temple, mm -hmm. and uh, they are remodeling the Manti Temple. And the initial plan was to gut it, get rid of those murals, and have an entirely new, updated temple. And the outrage uh, that came up after that was huge. Uh, at least in certain quarters, I may not have made its way to Northern Ireland, but anybody anywhere near the Manti Temple who had ever been to the Manti Temple was just furious that we were going to do this. This happened also on the heels of the remodeling of the Salt Lake Temple, where they did exactly the same thing. They don't have the sort of Minerva Tykert um, specific uh, murals, but you had pioneer era art that was on the walls of the Salt Lake Temple that had been that's been gutted. And when they initially announced that they were going to remodel the Salt Lake Temple, they said they were going to keep all of those. And then and they said, oh, oh no, we, we took pictures of them, uh, but no, we got it. And, and everybody was furious. <laughs> anyway, so the announcement was made. They were going to do the same thing with the Manti Temple. There was an outcry. And then the church reversed course. And Elder Rasband, in his statement, said, yes, we received revelation that we we need to keep those murals there. And by the way, this revelation had nothing to do with the outcry that, that we right. had. had nothing at all to do with it. And I just sat there going, why did you even have to say that? Because it's not true. Maybe you believe it's true, Elder Rasband. I'm not trying to say you're a liar. I'm just saying- want to seem like revelation comes from, from God. Revelation came because- well, 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 
even if it comes from the top down, the reason they even ask the question, they wouldn't have asked the question if people hadn't been upset. And what's wrong with admitting that? Uh, the church is able to admit that, for instance, when they changed the 2015 policy about baptizing the children of LGBTQ people, when they said, oh, this caused a lot of pain and everybody was upset, so we continued to seek the will of the Lord and we finally got confirmation that we needed to reverse this policy. Yeah. So they were willing to admit that, yes, the pain that people were experiencing, the discomfort with the policy, uh, was part of the process of them seeking revelation. Mm. But for whatever reason, we have a hard time accepting the reality that revelation comes, <coughs> excuse me, revelation comes when it's asked for. And it's not asked for if people aren't asking for it. Mm. <coughs> do you think you know, with, with regards to specifically the temple ceremony, do you think there's a point where, do you think there's a line to where th there'd be too too many changes or... <laughs> Is there a point where it's like they're removing so many parts where it's like, hold on, you're completely changing it from <laughs> what it was originally with Joseph Smith. I remember whenever I was sort of out of the church, my, when my dad described some of the changes because he was a temple worker and he said there's been some modifications to the temple ceremony and he sort of framed it as, you know, further light and knowledge and continual revelation. And my cynical mind was like, is it is it further light knowledge or are they just changing or getting rid of old stuff um why can't it be both I mean, because because if the problem is getting rid of old stuff means that old stuff was wrong or mistaken mm -hmm. yeah um <coughs> i got no problem with that that's the thing this is the the idea of infallibility the idea that everything there, there was some point in church history where we had every piece of knowledge we needed to have and everything was perfect. And so changing that is somehow wrong. Uh, that's kind of a ludicrous idea to me. Uh, so yeah, they're changing something because it was wrong or because it was a mistake or because it was, and, and so you have to allow for the possibility that that's even possible, that it's possible that the church can get things wrong. Yeah. And, I, I don't think you can have a healthy, sustainable faith without allowing for that possibility. Right. I, I think if you insist that the church has never gotten anything wrong, and then you probably end up having to leave the church because then you bump into things that are so transparently awful and wrong that you have no other recourse but to get, get lost. Yeah, and, I think that's what happens with a lot of people. Is uh, Absolutely what happens with a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, so... So yeah, I think in I I don't want to be uncharitable towards the church or say that they're guilty of this, but for example, for me, before I went diving into researching and looking at critical arguments, I would have had no idea that there were death penalties in the temple or points yeah. or you know the five points of fellowship or that there government used death to penalties. Go. I just want to point out no, no nobody was executed. Yes, for yeah. Temple secrets. The covenant was, you know, if, you just if I were to do, I, I mean, it, it, it was, it, it was, I would rather all these terrible things happen to me than reveal these temple secrets. Right. I think there for a lot of people, they mechanism. may not have been aware of some yeah. of those changes, you know, because the church wouldn't come out and say, oh, this is how the temple ceremony used to be. And it's changed so much over the years. They probably wouldn't say that or tell that to most of the membership maybe they have i know in their recent um last time i went to the temple i think they did talk about inspired modifications or alterations so maybe you could say they're being more transparent uh in those regards well i remember the most recent uh changes there was a thing at the beginning where they said you should not reveal these changes or reveal that these changes have taken place oh i don't remember that and, and i was like why not? <laughs> I, I mean, that didn't make any sense to me. And I mean, because what you think people aren't going to know this? Uh, everybody knows that there are ch that changes have taken place. I mean, it, it's made national news that changes have taken place. Hmm. I mean, I, I'm fully on board with not revealing, you know, the details, but just not even revealing that 
there was a change. I, I don't understand that reticence. And that reticence runs at every level of the church. Right. Uh, and, and and I just don't think it's healthy. And I don't I don't think that long term uh you're able to be able to maintain faith uh in the idea of an unchanging church that is built on modern revelation where change is baked into the mix. Right. What what do you say to those people? You know, Jeremy sort of asks, um, maybe it's a bit snarky. I don't want to be disrespectful as I say this, but some people feel that, you know, they've described the the temple endowment experiences maybe freak them out a little bit. Maybe they find it creepy, maybe they find it weird. They might think, why does God expect us to do all these rituals and you know, handshakes and, and so forth? And um, you know, it it's yeah, they, they just think it's it's weird. Um, and maybe they feel like they don't feel the spirit in there. Um, you know, we all have different experiences. I obviously find it strange. Um, it was eye-opening. I didn't know what to expect going into it, although it didn't cause me to freak out or anything like that. But some people see it as this seems quite culty. Um, just any any quick thoughts on that? I know it's kind of like a subjective question. I, no, it's it, it's... I would say to those people, I hear you because I'm one of them. Temple totally freaked me out first time I went through it. Uh, I still have some problems with it, with elements of it. It's not my favorite thing in the world. Uh, I mean, I, I look at people who who go through the temple and just, this is where I get all my answers. And I, as I said earlier, that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. I go through it and, and go, this is weird. I don't understand why I'm doing this. I don't understand why this is important. Uh, again, the things that that resonate with me are things outside the temple the idea of family history the idea of binding ourselves with our ancestors the actual temple rituals in and of themselves uh have never really uh, resonated with me in right. any kind of significant way i don't know if that's too wild a, a suggestion no uh, no that's that's totally totally I mean, your experience i mean I'm, I'm willing to go through I, 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 and I'm willing to keep the covenants that I make in the temple, including the ones that I, I, mean, I, I, I think the covenants about my behavior and my life and my commitment to Christ are more significant than my covenants not to reveal secrets that to me are, you know, it's like, really? The Lord cares that this is something the Lord cares about? I, that still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if that's faith faithless or terrible to say, uh, but uh, that's that's kind of where I am. I, I mean, and and I I've talked to people, very faithful members of the church, uh, many of some who say I'll never go back to the temple again. I just don't like the temple. Uh, yeah. What do you say to them? I it's like it's like you know I bless you on wherever your journey takes you, but I can fully understand that the temple is is. It, it, it's such a shock because it's so different from the church you grow up in. If you grew yeah. up in it, because you grow up in this idea that we don't believe in set prayers. We don't believe in the, the kinds of ritual, you know, you go to a meeting house and it's very plain. We don't have big ornate stained glass windows. We don't have crosses. We don't have all this stuff. And so you, you get in this idea of, okay, well, yeah, our church, the, one of the things that makes it cool is that we don't have set prayers and we don't, you know, and then you go to the temple and everything is by rote and everything is ritualistic Yeah. in a way that's entirely contrary um, to, to all these kinds of things. Uh, so, Something that, that, that I find, because I always, I kind of, whenever I first went through my faith crisis, I was really, started to feel really disturbed by the temple. You know, I alluded to this earlier, but whenever I watched um apologetics talking about the similarities between you know ancient priests and you know the rituals and, and the clothing they would have wore or like even if you look at monarchs and like a coronation ceremony and you know the the vows they make and you know they wear different clothing and i sort of made this connection in my mind that like you know oh we go through the temple to become like kings and priests yeah. unto god yeah. and i almost saw those sort of similarities and to me it was like oh maybe this is weird but maybe this is rooted in ancient symbolism and it's similar to like you know a, a coronation ceremony of a king or what the priest went yep. through you know and and that sort of 
what we're doing. I don't, I don't know. That was that's sort of my. Well, and my I have, I, I have tremendous respect for for people who find great value in the temple, and great value in the ritual. Uh, I think we're all different. I think we all resonate with different things, and I think if the temple is something that some people don't like, or something that some people don't resonate with to the same extent that other people do, uh, you probably should be yeah. empathy for that. I, I have a great deal of empathy for that. Yeah, and there's that question from Jeremy Runnels. You know, why would God require, you know, th all these things like secret tokens, handshake signs to get into the celestial kingdom? You think it, on Judgment Day it would just be more about how you've lived your life and your faith and I, I can I can empathize with them because it's hard for me to visualize doing all those things to enter into the celestial kingdom right well and and the thing about it is that the, the thing that people miss about the temple uh and I guess this is the one thing about the temple that that I really love uh the older I get the more of a universalist I am the more yeah. I believe that everybody eventually gets where they need to be I believe in a movement between the kingdoms. I believe that eternity is a freaking long time. And, uh, you know, if you want to public punish Hitler for a billion years uh, for each Jew that died in the Holocaust, and so he did, he's burning for six trillion, billion, zillion years, that's still a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. You know, I, eternity goes on forever. And so I think eventually everybody gets where they need to be. Um, mm. The temple is the most powerful symbol of universalism in the church. Yeah. Because, yes, we say everybody needs to learn these things, these signs and tokens, to, to get past the angels that stand as sentinels. I mean, that's the Brigham Young statement that is told to you before you go in the temple and you have no idea what it means until you go through the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, but the thing is, there isn't anybody that's going to get to that point and not know that information because we do proxy work for the dead and we plan on doing proxy work on behalf of everyone who has ever lived. So you're telling me that you need to know that information? Yeah, I'm telling you that. Uh, I'm also telling you that every single person that has ever lived or ever will live will be equipped with that information when the time comes. You know, so that's not going to be the differentiator that some people think it's going to be. Mm. The temple is a manifestation that we are teaching the gospel and, and giving the opportunity to accept the gospel to every person who has ever lived. So nobody is going to be able to stand before the bar of God and say, well, you can't really judge me because you never, ever taught me any of this stuff. Yeah, everyone gets eventually the everybody will be taught everything they need to know. So, so, so that part, but with that, what that also says to me is, so why does that matter that we have to do it now? Now, and I don't fully understand that. I mean, th that's a part that doesn't really resonate with me. Yeah, it's like I, I don't see anything particularly significant about what we do at the veil at the temple. I just kind of go, okay, yeah, this is the ritual. This is what I have to do, uh, but it's never really resonated with me in the way it does with some other people. Yeah, no, that's fair. Totally got it. Do we have time to talk about polygamy? My wife just texted me and said, I'm in big trouble that I need to start cleaning stuff. Okay. Uh, Do you want to leave it there for today? Me, yeah, let, let's, let's leave that out for today. Uh, but I'd love to have, I hope I'm not boring you to death. But No, I'd I'm enjoying this. Take as much time as we need, but we may need to break it up yes. a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, so when so let polygamy I think is an hour an hour and a half all on its own. It, it could be, and then when we talk about prophets and you know maybe the church yeah. and LGBT um, yeah. stuff, yeah, we might need another episode or two. Yeah. But we we can try to schedule a time um, after okay. we uh, start recording and uh, bring you back to finish talking about these things. But this has been a, a great discussion. I uh, appreciate you know your your thoughts you're taking it your willingness to have this dialogue and to again be asked some tough questions um and i hope the listeners as well who are watching this enjoy it as well if you have please give it a thumbs up uh, like share and subscribe and check out his faithful response to a cs letter and also put in links where you can watch uh jim on other podcasts as well um yeah appreciate this time jim for you coming on well thank you very much appreciate yeah. the opportunity We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Okay. Take care.